the beginning of this conference you will be faithful tonight we bless your name jesus you can raise your voice tell him lord i worship i give you thanks i exalt you hallelujah my god is worthy of all the praise
Oh, we give you all the glory. My God, you are worthy. Lord, we magnify you, Jesus. We extol your holy name, Ramandos. Hallelujah to you, only you, Father. You don't want to come with humility tonight. Just lift your hands, lift your hands. Let's bow. Father, we come and we bow and worship you, God. Come and lift your hands high. We bow and worship you.
Blessed be your glorious name. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you. All throughout this week, our God has demonstrated his love towards us as a people. From the very onset, the arrival of delegates, uh, the flying in of our main speaker, uh, all the sermons that had been heard. Uh, I, you know, God has shown us that he has interest in what we are doing here. Uh, and uh, the fellowship at large, many of them are viewing in, they're watching what's going on here with an expectant heart. We are grateful that we are amongst the living uh, to witness all that God is doing on planet Earth. Say amen, somebody. All that God is doing in our churches, in our fellowship, not just here in Nigeria, but in Ghana, in Ivory Coast, in Liberia, and the uttermost parts of the world, we are great. Let's thank God for that tonight. Father, we are so grateful. We are thankful, God, for all that you have done and all that you are doing. Hallelujah. Now we want to, one last time in our conference, we want to petition heaven. With a heart of gratitude, we want to thank God. We want to come before him that this last, uh, he always saves the last, uh, the best of the last. Tonight's going to be special. We want to believe God for that. Uh, we're going to lift up our voices. Represent your church tonight. Represent your pastor. Represent your congregation. Represent your city. Call it by name. Call that God will outpour his spirit upon uh, our churches. And as we subside in prayer, uh, a pastor from uh, Dermy Church, a uh, pastor Chris, uh, would come and open us up in prayer. Would you raise up your voices tonight? Uh, Father, we are so grateful. Oh, God, 
we are asking you, God, tonight for an outpouring of your spirit, God. God, we need you once again, God, in this place. We are asking you, God, again that you will visit us, God. God, that you will open the heavens, God, tonight, God, in this place. God, that you speak a word, God. God, a rhema once again stir our hearts. God, we have come tonight, God, to meet with you, God. We have come tonight, God, that you will visit us. God, that this all this tonight. God, that you would meet with us, God. God, come down tonight in this place. God, stir our hearts, oh God, for the nations, God, in the cities, God. God, in all that you are going to do, God. God, meet with us tonight. We give you all the praise, God, all the glory, God. Move tonight in the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. Go right into you. Greet the people standing around you there with a smile on your face. Come on, smile and greet somebody this evening. Amen. Let's find our seats this evening. Hallelujah. We want to especially welcome you to the final session and the final night of the 2024 uh, Bible conference that looks not just after the Nigerian fellowship, but also the Ghanaian fellowship, uh, uh, the Ivorian fellowship, uh, the Liberian fellowship. Uh, we are thankful that you are here to witness this. We know this evening that God has spoken to many of us. If you've listened to all 17 sermons, I no doubt that God had deposited things that you will need uh, in not a distant future, weeks to come, months to come, you'll remember these messages. And if you forget, you could go online and watch them all over again. There are people viewing us right now from all around the world watching live stream. We're thankful for them also. But we're hopeful that, uh, uh, that one day they'll visit our church here in Ikeja and be all part of, part of all that God is doing here. Amen. Amen. So this evening we... Are going to move on very quickly. As you know, uh, the final night, because of modalities, uh, we would not be having any reports this evening. Neither would we be having a special song. Uh, but I just want to go on record to say I do appreciate every single one of you that made an effort to give uh, throughout this week, uh, to be here throughout this week. Uh, amen. And so this evening, we're going to call upon Pastor B12 Hagindu to come and receive the offering. Amen. It's been a great conference. Can somebody say amen? amen? I mean, quality preaching. I mean, every message resonated. Amen. I mean, you can tell that, you know, God is doing something. And uh, uh, tonight I want to uh, 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 take uh, the remainder of God's money in your pocket. Um, I'm going to read from the text in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 to 14. And I want to speak to you for a moment about a dimension uh, that you need to operate in. That's uh, uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 to 14. He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so, they, so that they may accuse him? He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched, out his, stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. I want to mention a few things. Just listen to me for a few minutes, uh, uh, if you can have your attention. Because I believe this will help many, 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 many lives right now. What is a miracle? If you had to define what is a miracle. The definition that I have for a miracle, a miracle is when something unnatural is touched by the supernatural to bring it back to its natural state. Everything has a natural state or a normal state. 
There is uh, an accepted way that something should function as. Uh, in our text, for example, we have a man with a withered hand. That's unnatural. That's abnormal. That's uh, not supposed to be that way. So, natural can further be described as a state in which God dis, uh, designed something to be. A human being is not designed by God to be in pain. A human being is not designed by God to be deformed, crooked, or ha have any other kind of abnormality. We are supposed to be normal according to God's design in the context of this natural state. The unnatural state is when what is normal or natural become abnormal. It has deformities. It's aberrant. It's not what it's supposed to be. We all know what's unnatural. We know what's abnormal. We know what's aberrant. So what is the supernatural we add to that? The supernatural is uh, when something is not conformed to the natural forces or laws, sometimes beyond normal or natural. A miracle is when, uh, 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 for a miracle to happen, let me go about that way, for a miracle to happen, there has to be an unnatural state. Listen to me, everybody, now. For a miracle to happen, there has to be an unnatural state. Jesus, I never saw Jesus in the whole Bible. Uh, he was somebody who was okay. He says, I came for the sick. He did not come for the ones who are okay. So, if you are normal, Jesus looks at you. That's the way you're supposed to be. But a miracle, for a miracle to happen, something has to be unnatural. Something has to be abnormal. Like in our text, there is a man who has a withered hand. Miracles to happen, it needs first that you identify what's abnormal, what's unnatural, what's aberrant. Our text here that I just read, Jesus walks into a synagogue, a church, a congregation. And right there it says, and he went, from out, uh, went on from there and entered the synagogue. And a man with a withered hand was there. He enters this church and one of the significant things he sees is an abnormality. Something unnatural. He sees first there's a person there in the midst of God's church and synagogue. Somebody with a withered hand. Jesus represents the supernatural. Here in this church, we see a few things. People in this church had gotten used to being around this unnatural phenomenon. This man with the withered hand, the people in that synagogue just got used to it. Hey, he's part of us or uh, he comes, he visits or whatever it was that they concluded on that. I'm looking at people here. You can get used to living in an unnatural financial state. I hope I'm talking to somebody now. These people in this church, there's a man with a withered hand. Jesus and God, he notices him first. This is unnatural. There are people, Christians, who live in an unnatural, an abnorm abnormal financial state, and they see it as normal. Broke every day. Debt. You can't eat enough. You are constantly struggling, and it has become normal. You even call yourself, I'm a hustler. It's how hustlers live. That's abnormal. You are supposed to have enough to eat, enough to bless people, and enough left over to give the house of God. But we find ourselves in these abnormal circumstances, and we don't notice it, and we just keep coming to church. Pastors, you can pastor a church 
with people with abnormal situations. And you call it normal. These people don't give. It's the way they are. That's abnormal. That's unnatural. These people don't give. I don't know what they are. I give illustrations. I do. That's abnormal. God's people, it's natural. When they get, somebody gets saved, they give. It comes on you. It's organic. You don't have to think about it. But when that's not happening, something is abnormal there. The devil flourishes in keeping people unnatural. And there are people here on your financial side, it's unnatural. If I calculate the debt you owe, you owed money to come to conference. You borrowed money to do this. You borrowed money to do that. You borrowed money to do And that's not normal. You cannot have a household that everything, rent comes up, it's never there. This comes up, it's never, and that's been your whole life. And you are here, we were singing, you are Yahweh, you was, praise God. That's abnormal. There's a man with a withered hand, he's in the church. Jesus enters this place, and the people there, you can see them, they begin to work with him. They, you know, work him and say, hey, hey, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath? Is it okay to deliver people in church? Is it okay to see people, they begin to, you know, you begin to, when you're unnatural state, you begin to build a theology on it. That's when it becomes dangerous. Your brokenness, your lack of money, you begin to say, it's where God has made me to be. God did not make anybody unnatural or abnormal. He made you to be normal. So, we begin to build theologies on that. Borrowing becomes part of it. Ah, it's the way I'll survive. God has said, you know, you begin to look for scriptures to back you up on that. You build a theology. Pastors, you build theologies. Come somebody, ah, it's the way this church is. God is going to, God says, it's, 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 it's giving blessings are in the immediate so we find a man that they test Jesus in this. Oh, on the Sabbath, you know, uh, 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 you know, can you heal? Jesus says, on the Sabbath, you do what is good. And this is in church. We are supposed to give you a revelation and get you into a good state. What is a miracle? A miracle is when the supernatural touches the unnatural to bring it back to normal. I want this evening your finances to come back to normal. I don't want to see you every conference we come. There are people you are always, you know, you never enjoy giving. You never enjoy anything. Your family, your children, school fees, everything about you is struggle after struggle after struggle. You can't afford to do anything. Anything. It's like, just the devil has sat on you and you live in this unnatural state but if you endured it for so long, you just accept it. But today is the day you're going to say, I'm not going to accept that. Jesus turned and looked at this, looked at this man with a withered hand. And you know what he told him? He said, stretch it forth. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, stretch it forth. Tell yourself, I'm going to stretch it forth. Jesus turns and looks at this, this guy and says, hey, listen, stretch it forth. It's unnatural for your hand to be that way. And I'm pointing at your finance. It's unnatural for your finances to be that way. Stretch them forth. Stretch them forth. Take from where they are and stretch them forth towards Jesus. It didn't, this man was not stretch it forth, wasn't stretch it the other side. Stretch it forth towards me. Stretch it forth. And, and that arm immediately got restored. I believe right now God wants to restore financial statuses in people's life to be no more. That you have enough to eat and you have enough left over to give to others. You have mothers in the village, parents in the village, brothers and Everything, people, is always you can't even send 5,000 naira to your parents. That's unnatural. 
That's unnatural. Today is a day that you stretch it forth. It's not normal for you to be a chronic debtor. It's not normal for your church to have a congregation of people who cannot get high-end jobs. People can't get promoted. People can't go on to new levels. It's not natural, pastor, for your church to be that way. It's not normal for your marriage to constantly struggle financially forever. It's not normal for a conference with over 400 people struggling to pay for itself. It's not normal. I was talking to Pastor Glenn. I said, how much has come in so far? Pledge everything that we've done from Sunday to today. It's about 5.5 million. Pastor Glenn mentioned it. The conference cost us 12 million. We're still short by 6.5 million. It's not normal. It's unnatural. It's abnormal. 400 people couldn't come up with money to sort out this problem. We need to stretch forth and take this abnormality out of the Nigerian fellowship. Is somebody with me, somebody? We need to take it out. You know how this man, how Jesus took it out of that synagogue? He says, stretch forth. This abnormality doesn't belong here. Stretch forth. Everybody here, say stretch forth again. You need to stretch forth today. I looked at the balance of the money that's remaining. I said, out of all of us who are here, 400 plus people. If all of us commit to 20,000 naira, we'll take care of the bill. If every one of us today, I know yesterday we made a pledge, but if you can commit, stretch further, amen? amen. And take another 20,000 you're going to add. Every one of us, minimum 20,000, will cross that line. And will take this abnormality out of our conference forever and ever. We will take this abnormality out of our homes forever and ever. We will take it out. Because why? When you begin to learn to stretch forth towards Jesus, miracles happen. The supernatural touches the abnormal things and they become normal. A miracle occurs. We are here. Some of us daily struggles. It's enough. Stretch forth. You can't be walking day in, day out, limping financially. It's about time you got out. Today's the last night. I want when we come back next year, before we even the conference, Pastor Glenn would have said, listen, from last year, there's excess money because we stretch forth. Because we stretch forth. Every one of us, if we can give a minimum of 20,000 naira extra. I know we've given. We've been faithful. I'm not doubting what people have done. There are people who have stretched forth a lot. But I'm asking you, can you stretch further? We get this done. Let's get this abnormality out of here. This withered hand does not belong in the house of God. These withered financial situations don't belong in the house of God. Let's get them out. It says that day, this was released. Recently, about a week or so ago, we were planning for conference because uh, the first church would bring in people from Port Harcourt, uh, Abuja, uh, our pastors and other dynamics that we have to do, you know, hotels and stuff like that. I was, it was Easter morning, and I had absolutely nothing. And I'm, I'm, I'm not being uh, just uh, trying to sway you in a way, but I absolutely had no money. But when I came to the offering on Easter, I gave a certain amount. That was the last money I had. I transferred it. That was it. We were going for you know, the, the, our church on Easter Monday. We usually go to the beach to go just relax a little bit. And uh, our conference was coming up. And I knew the bill that was coming. I knew the bill that was coming. 
all the stuff, you know, support for the churches, this and that. I sat down in that place. That evening, I, you know, we slept. It was Easter. Next morning, I wake up in the morning. And this is a mighty God if you stretch forth. Now, so I'm sharing this with you. Because I just experienced it a week ago. I look at my phone. And somebody there sent money. I looked at the amount of money. First I looked at it, I said, I thought it was those bank charges. You know what I'm saying, somebody? I said, ah. Then I looked again. This person, remember, I just stretched forth. Sent money to the church and sent money to me. He sent me 400,000 naira. And to the church, he put another amount of money. We took care of everything that needs to be taken care of. Simply because I can link it to that ability that you can stretch further. Amen? Everybody here. I'm going to do something. You know, I know Pastor, Pastor Stevens took a pledge yesterday. But I want to give you the fellowship account number. The Nigerian fellowship account number. I'm going to give you a slip of paper. And I'm going to give you the end of May. I know you're going to you've got a pledge that you have for, 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 for uh, this month. But I'm talking an extra 20000 and above. Every person here, I want you to commit to that. And I want without financial situations to leave us forever. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't want to ever see any one of us here begging for money. I don't want to see a church struggling to buy petrol, struggling to buy flyers, struggling, pastors struggling to eat. It's about time you stretch forth. You can go to your bank account and look at your, 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 your listen, I'll stretch forth this. On behalf of the church, I'll stretch forth for my family and I'll stretch forth for myself, for the church. And you do that, I can get, if Jesus could do this in the church, he's willing right now as I'm speaking to everybody here, he's waiting for who will stretch forth. He did not say, bring your hand, I'll pull it. He says, you do it. You are the one who in that condition, stretch forth. The ushers would help me bring those sleeps, please. There's just the fellowship. You keep that, put it in your purse, put it in your pocket, and that account number, by the end of May, I, I ask everybody, let's stretch forth. We're going to give today. There are some right now you can stretch forth. The account number is on the, the board here. You can do more. I'm saying the minimum, minimum is 20,000. Let's stretch forth. There are some you can stretch forth for your children upstairs. You say, for this child, I'm going to stretch forth. I'll put for another above this. And for this child, I'll put that. And I'll put that. And you stretch forth. That one, you just take it. Keep it. Give everybody. Put it in your purse. Put it in your wallet. Put it. And remember, by the end of May, stretch forth. We're going to give. Has everybody gotten a, a, a piece of paper, please? Keep it. There are teenagers here. Stretch forth. Believe God and say, when the supernatural came into that church and say, stretch forth, that man was brought back to normal. There's a normal state God wants you to be in financially. The Bible says the children of God should not be begging for bread. You shouldn't be begging for bread. You should be giving out bread. You should be the lender, not the borrower. I hope I'm talking to somebody now. You are the lender, not the borrower. We are the giver, not the taker. Because why? Right now, we're going to give. There are people you can, you know, if you're going to stretch forth, stretch forth right now.
Let's give. Let's take this abnormality out of the Nigerian fellowship. Amen. I cannot do it by myself. We can do it together. And I appreciate everybody for the week I know you've given. But let's stretch forth. Let's enlarge and push forth. Pastors, you can do it. Look out for your church. Look out for your ministry. Stretch forth right now. Stretch forth. There might be the last amount in your account. Stretch it forth. Stretch it forth right now. All the miracles are to come. This man went in that church with that hand. He came out waving at everybody. Probably that day he went to work. He could work again. He could do things he could never do before. There are financial situations God is going to give you. You do things you've never done before. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's pray. The ashes would come. I want us to pray over this offering. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise. I give you worship. God, I pray your supernatural touch come upon every unnatural situation, God, financially right now. God, I pray faith comes into these people. And God, will stretch forth that dear God, you'll bring the financial situation to normalcy, oh God. Let every financial situation come back to normalcy, God. That dear God, I have enough. Enough and with some left over God to give. Lord, I pray, Almighty Father God, that nobody, God, here will miss that. Let them be committed, God, to bringing, God, these resources. Giving them right now, God. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise and worship, God. I thank you, God, for this privilege that, dear God, we can stretch forth and cast out an abnormality, oh God. You are a wonderful God. Your revelation is wonderful, oh God. God, I give you praise, glory, and honor. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give the man in this place. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Son. Declare your skipper's love in the morning And your faithfulness by night It is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord You could clap your and hands, sing praises you could clap your voices To your name, to declare your skipper's love in the morning And your faithfulness by night most high, most high, most high, you are high above the peace we broke it. Come on, you clap those hands. Most high, yes, Lord. Most high, we sing praises to your name, most high. It is good, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name. In the morning, and your faithfulness, my sin, most high. Hallelujah. We thank those of you on the platform. Let's show them that we do appreciate them. Thank you. Well, we've always known this. We've always said this, that God truly saves the best till last. Pastor Paul Stevens is indeed a father to us here. Uh, perhaps the most visited leader in our fellowship to the Nigerian, Ghanaian, the African fellowship here uh, that we represent. We thank him. He's a friend of the Nigerian fellowship. He's our friend. Uh, he's our dad. He's our father. He's our, oh, he's everything. Amen. And tonight, I'm sure he would require us to give him, 
his uh, attention, that he might speak life into us again. Uh, let's welcome Pastor Paul Stevens this week. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very, very much. I'm so uh, grateful and appreciative for the opportunity to be here with you uh, this week and on the final night of your great conference here uh, in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm going to go back with a great report to my church on Sunday, and we will be praying for you and believing God to continue to move in West Africa and all over the continent of Africa. And I'm grateful for all the pastors that have come from other nations. I have churches in uh, Ghana, the Ivory Coast, and uh, Liberia, and I'm appreciative for what God's doing in those uh, nations through those pastors. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. I want to preach tonight on a central theme that was preached on over and over again in the formative years of our fellowship. And that theme is very simple. God has an address for your life. And you better find out what that address is, make a covenant with that address, and remain in place no matter what. People are transient. I don't know how transient they are here in Africa, but in America, everybody wants to move all the time. They get a better job. They don't like uh, the city where they are. They have problems in the church and relational issues. Uh, and so their answer is always to leave. But people do not leave churches to find better ways to serve God. God has an address for your life. So let me ask you a few questions tonight. Number one, are you happy where you are in your situation? And that may sound a little superficial. Maybe a better way to say it is, do you feel purpose-driven where you are? Do you believe you're in the will of God where you are? This is something that had to be taught and reinforced in the early days, as I said, of our fellowship. God's will has an address for your life, and part of the devil's strategy is to dislodge you from your place, and therefore he will weaken and can even rob you of your destiny, because your destiny is connected with a location, not a place of your choosing or your preference, but a place of God's choosing. This is a picture here on the screen of King George and his wife, the Queen of England. King George was king from 1936 to 1952. And it is said that his greatest achievement came during the Second World War when he remained at the palace in London while the city was being bombed. Their palace, where they lived, was bombed nine times during the war, and he and his wife never left. They were trying to get them to leave, go to a safe place out in the country. They were talking uh, to them about coming to America. They could have easily left a, a place that was very dangerous. But they didn't leave. They remained in place. They remained in the place where they could do the most good. On the morning of September 13th, 1940, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were minding their own business and drinking tea in their palace uh, when they heard a rumble and a crash. A German raider had dropped five high explosive bombs on the palace. The royal chapel, the inner court, the palace gates, and the Victoria Memorial were all damaged by the bombs. 
Four members of the palace staff were injured and one would die. These are a couple of other pictures. That's the queen and king ex uh, examining uh, uh, the damage there in workers cleaning up the rubble. And then another picture. This is outside the palace. One of the bombs landed uh, in the street just outside the palace uh, and, uh, and created a big hole in the street and damaged uh, the gate. The king and queen of England were advised by the foreign office to immediately flee the country. But their steadfast refusal showed courage and commitment that the public appreciated and it inspired them and it rallied them. In a statement to the nation, Queen Elizabeth exclaimed, the children will not leave unless I do. I shall not leave unless their father does, and the king will not leave the country in any circumstances whatever. The king famously said, my place is here in London among the people at Buckingham Palace, and I'm not leaving. He located himself in the place where he could do the most good despite the threats of danger and death and bombs falling uh, and he was able to rally people to fight back against uh, the assault that was coming against their lives. You cannot serve effectively at a place of your choosing. Sometimes things can look pretty bleak where you are. Standing in rubble, your house under threat of being destroyed by bombs. Things can look pretty bleak where you are, even when you're in the will of God. And sometimes one of the things you need to learn is to wait right where you are for the better days that are to come. This is one of the most important lessons of life. And we learn it from the beginning of the book of Ruth surrounding the events of a man named Elimelech. We don't always uh, or often mention Elimelech in the book of Ruth. Uh, there are far more significant characters in the book of Ruth, and his name is only mentioned uh, in the first few verses that we're going to be reading. But his life and his mistake carries a vital lesson. Discontent with where you are is a destiny killer. Let's read our text. Ruth 1, beginning in verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Things got very bleak in Israel. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife is Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malern and Chilion. They went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the women survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return to the country, from the country of Moab, for she had heard that in the country, uh, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Father, thank you for such great grace and blessing and favor in this assembly, in this great conference, Lord. We pray for special anointing tonight to touch every heart, minister to every life, and let us go forth from this conference uh, stronger than ever, more committed uh, to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. I want to talk first of all about what happens 
when you allow fear to play a role in your decisions. Fear will cause you to forsake a life of faith, a life of obedience, and a life that is leading you toward your destiny. And fear has a lot to do with how we react to life. Consider all the things that we do because of fear. Internally, fear causes us to doubt God. Are we in the will of God when bombs are falling? How could you let this happen? When people are hurting me and slandering me and things aren't going well and I'm not bearing fruit, how can this be a reflection of God's will? Fear causes doubt, which causes you to question God. It causes confusion and uncertainty. And then that will always lead to bad decisions. Fear causes destiny-killing decisions. This is why there are so many fear knots in the Bible. Fear is lethal, it is insidious, and it is a destiny killer. Second Timothy says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You don't have a sound mind when fear is in place. You're not going to make right decisions. You're unequipped to make right decisions. People that are bound by the spirit of fear will always act on it. If the king and queen of England were afraid, they would have fled. If fear had dominated their thinking, we have to be in a safe place for ourselves and our children. If that would be what's best for our family, if they would have made a very wrong decision. That's why Jesus said in Luke 12, 32, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You don't get the kingdom when fear is at work. Elimelech, reacts to the famine with fear. And he makes an ill-advised decision that cost him his life and destiny. The move to Moab killed Elimelech and his two sons. The book of Ruth should be called the book of Elimelech because there was destiny connected with Elimelech God was able to salvage the destiny. When Naomi moved back to Israel, he was able to work through her situation. We'll get to that shortly and recover some semblance of destiny. But Elimelech blew it when he made a decision to leave God's address for his life. And it got him killed and it got his two sons killed. He had no ability then to bear fruit and to keep his name alive. Moab where Elimelech moved to represents what we think is a better place from where we are now. Moab can be another church. It can be another job in another city. It can be moving back with a family or with our family uh, uh, somewhere else here in Nigeria. Because we're struggling here. It's hard here. It's difficult here. It's challenging here. I'm tired of the fight and the bombs falling and the rubble that I have to navigate my way through. There are better jobs in Moab. There's no famine in Moab. There's provision and security. And if I move to Moab, I won't have the problems that I'm having here. All the king and queen would have had to do is move to America, and they wouldn't have the problems that they were having living in England. The problem with Moab, however, is that it's outside the will of God for your life. And there is such a place for everyone. David, when he was fleeing from Saul, sought a place of safety that ended up being outside the will of God. What did he do? He fled to the territory of the Philistines and made a covenant with the enemies of Israel. If I move there, Saul won't chase me anymore. That's what he said. He's tired of running. He's fearful for his life. Listen to what he said. In 1 Samuel 27, David said in his heart, I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. That wasn't true. 
Fear has distorted his decision making and he ends up going to a type of Moab. And then he goes on, there's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape from the land of the Philistines. Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. David's afraid. And he flees to what he thinks is a better place, a safer place. And it was for a while. The Philistines gave him a city. He and his men are not running in the wilderness in, anymore and living rough. Uh, they have houses. They have vineyards. They have fields. They have herds. Uh, and they can go out raiding and they accumulate all kinds of wealth. But it's one bad decision after another. Once you make a decision based on fear and you relocate yourself, then other bad decisions come. And it was inevitable that eventually the Philistines would go to war with Israel. What does David do? He gets his men and tries to join the Philistine army. Try to imagine that. What in the world are you doing? You slew Goliath, a Philistine. You went to war against the Philistine when you were a much younger man, and now you're aligning yourself with them to fight against Israel. Isaac thought about going to Egypt during a famine before God spoke to him. He was at God's address for his life. He wants to leave, and God spoke to him. And the Bible says in Genesis 26, there was a famine in the land, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. I have an address for your life. Dwell in this land, and I'll be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath uh, which I swore to Abraham your father. Uh, but there was a famine in the land. There were bombs falling on their palace, uh, and it didn't look very good. It was a very bleak situation. Uh, but you have to learn to remain in place when things don't look very good and wait for better days to come. Elimelech's decision was not his only option. What would have happened and what could have happened to Elimelech and his sons had he responded with faith to the famine? Boaz did, and Boaz steps into the destiny that he should have had. He doesn't leave town for another job during a famine. Boaz didn't seek security somewhere else. He faced the famine head on, remained in place, and he had a lot to lose. He's a landowner. He can't raise crops. Probably, I would say, that Boaz had made provision to sustain himself during a famine. He thought ahead. He made plans. Famines happen. I better be ready. But he wrote it out, trusted God, and eventually, guess what? The famine came to an end. And those better days came, and he steps into a destiny that should have been Elimelech's destiny. Elimelech traded God's will for his own purpose. Elimelech left Israel because he saw the problem as where he was, not who he was. Who he was was the problem. A fear-based man, absent of faith, and he went astray. Where faith should have been in place to inspire a right decision, fear was in place to inspire a very wrong, destiny-killing decision. If Satan can convince you that where you are is the problem, where you are, there are better places I can go to and not have to suffer like I'm suffering here. If Satan can convince you that where you are is the problem, he can take control of the steering mechanism of your life. You know what Elimelech would have said as he's loading boxes and getting ready to move and his neighbors are going to him and say, Elimelech, what are you doing? You know what he would have said? He would have said, oh, I've prayed about this. 
Yes, I have. This is what's best for my family. If we stay here, we have less. If we go to Moab, we're going to have abundance. It's going to be wonderful. You should come with me. This is what's in the best interest of my family, he would have said. He would have had to justify it. People would have asked him. Elimelech was a prominent man in Israel. If we move to another city, we're going to have more. If we stay here, bombs are falling. We're going to struggle. Have you ever considered that God has put you where you are? God did that. In your city, in your church, at this time, in this situation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God has set the members in the church, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased God has an address for your life. You have to find out what that is and commit yourself to that. That's where you're going to do the most good. That's where your destiny lies. Consider Lot. Lot left as soon as opportunity presented itself and he lost destiny. There are greener pastures over there. Not here with Abraham, but over there. Lot was never grateful. He was the nephew of Abraham, the greatest man on earth at that time. And Abraham was the centerpiece of what God was doing on earth. It was going to be through the lineage of Abraham that God was going to build a people and eventually build his church. And so when Lot is considering leaving, the Bible says that Lot lifted his eyes saw the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, uh, as you go towards Zoar, then Lot chose for himself. That's what it's all about. It's about me. It's about what I want. It's about going to a safer, better place. It's about ridding myself of the problems that I have here. And the Bible says he journeyed east and he separated from Abraham. Big mistake. Lot left out from under the covering of Abraham and what God was doing and he led his family into the teeth of danger. The Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom, that wicked city, and then the next thing he's in Sodom, and then the next thing he's taken as a captive during a war, and then the next thing he has to flee Sodom because the angel of the Lord are going to destroy it, and he lost his wife, and he left his two sons-in-law behind. Messed it all up for him. It's destiny killing. Elimelech, didn't see himself as the problem, and he went astray. The moment you wander from your place, you're going astray. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. The word astray there means to stagger, as if intoxicated. You, you don't make right decisions when you're intoxicated. Proverbs says, like a bird that wanders from its nest, so is a man who wanders from his place. God's will for your life has an address. Your destiny has an address. Fear will remove you from God's address for your life. I want to talk secondly about waiting. Waiting for better days. There are so many benefits to remain in place even when bombs are falling, even when it's hard, even when there's a famine. We need patience, especially when things are challenging and things get difficult and fear tries to take over. I'm not going to live in fear. I'm not going to make fear-based decisions. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to remain in place, do the will of God, even in the face of a famine. And what that does is it takes courage. The king and queen of England could have been killed. Most days when the bombs were falling, the King of England was put on his uniform, like you saw in the picture, 
and the queen would dress up and they would go out among the people and greet them while they were uh, dealing with all the rubble in their destroyed homes. And he did that to encourage them. 35,000 civilians were killed in London alone during the Blitz. It took courage for them to remain in place. So let me talk about the benefits of waiting and having patience and trusting God. First of all, there's power in waiting. When you have patience because of faith and you don't flee because of fear, there's a supernatural dimension of strength that is deposited in your life. Isaiah 40, verse 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But that requires waiting on the Lord. The Amplified Bible says, those who wait on the Lord, who expect to look for and hope in Him, will gain new strength, and they will renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles rising toward the sun. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not grow tired. Life can weaken you. Fear will weaken you. Elimelech and his sons die because they, they were weak. Their bodies gave out. I don't know if it was sickness or what the cause was, but the sons of Elimelech were young men. Elimelech, their father, was a little older, but he had years in front of him had he obeyed God and experienced the strength that God provides. Boaz, when you get to him in the book of Ruth, exudes strength and courage and foresight in the face of a crippling famine. He remains in place, uh, and God makes provision. Uh, Elimelech exudes weakness and fear and unbelief, and whatever strength he had uh, diminished unto his death. Boaz is filled with life and vitality, and he's able to respond to an opportunity to step into an incredible destiny. What do we need when we're challenged? We need the strength that stabilizes us in the will of God, even in the middle of a famine and even when bombs may be falling. Patience and faith. Covenant with the address that God has for your life uh, results in God strengthening you to remain in place. Secondly, Waiting adds to and grows our faith and confidence in our ability to trust. As I said in the introduction, people don't leave the church to find better ways to serve God. They may try to convince you of that, but that's not what's going on. Waiting on God where you are means you trust God. Elimelech lost his life, his name because his two sons died, his lineage, there's no one to leave his heritage with. There's nothing about trusting God with his decision. Elijah had to endure a drought. He remained in place. During the drought, he was able to prophesy and minister, and miracles occurred through his ministry. And guess what? Rain finally came. Better days come. Better days are in your future. What if he had left? He needed to serve God in the midst of a famine for the sake of benefiting others. And then thirdly, waiting enables God to work in your life. You either attach to the will of God by discovering the address and remaining in place, or you can detach from the will of God by fleeing from your place because of fear. You are where you are for a reason. People say things like, Pastor, I need to fix my situation in another place. No, God needs to fix you where you are. Things will get better, Pastor, when I move. No, things will get better when you repent and you change and you get rid of your funky attitude. Elijah endured a three-and-a-half-year famine, 
but he never fled. He could have gone to Egypt or Moab or any number of places. The, the famine was in Israel. Can you wait? Wars come to an end. That's what the king of England's confidence was. The will of God is what's most valuable, not you getting to Moab where you think you're going to have less problems, abundance. Uh, if I stay in place, uh, I'm going to struggle. If I move, I'm going to experience abundance. Well, that's what Elimelech thought, but that is not what happened. It was a misguided decision that cost him his destiny. And then the time comes, finally, it came time for Naomi to return and get back to the will of God for her life. She's had enough. She's standing in the ashes after bombs have fallen on her family and it costs the life of her husband and her two sons. And she decides what you need to decide. You need to get back to the will of God. You can be sitting in church and not be here because you're discontent. You're not happy where you are. You don't see destiny where you are. The devil is working to dislodge you, and that, become, uh, that begins with a spirit of discontent, uh, and we become critical, and we're looking for reasons to leave and to go and find somewhere else uh, that we think is a better place than where we are. Naomi returned to the will of God. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Yeah, better days always come. She should have stayed in place with her husband and sons. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was to return to the land of Judah. Time to get back where you belong. Time to commit to stay where you belong. If you're thinking about going to Moab, it's time to get back to the will of God in your life instead of living a fear-based life based on not trusting God. Verse 6, then she arose that she might return, and she took her two daughters-in-law with her. The book of Ruth begins with tragedy, and it ends with a woman, Naomi, who was able to reconnect with destiny. It wasn't the destiny that she could have had originally, but God doesn't quit. He'll rewrite the chapter, rewrite the script, give you another opportunity, make every effort to salvage destiny. The book of Ruth begins with tragedy, but it ends with destiny and blessing because Naomi makes a comeback. But the Bible tells us that she returns bitter. Where does her bitterness come from? Her bitterness came from a man who ran from the will of God. You better watch out, husband and father, with the decisions that you make because it can open the door when your wife sees the decisions you're making are not, are not benefiting, they're not leading to the will of God, they're not leading to anything. Nothing was better for them in Moab. None of the illusions that Elimelech left for uh, were realized uh, and they lost everything. She lost everything nearly. You have no idea what you're putting into those around you when you make your fear-based decisions. And then be careful you don't blame God for the consequences of your own bad decisions. Ruth, uh, I mean, Naomi went along with him. She should have said, what are you doing, fool? I'm not leaving. We need to remain in place. She should have been a catalyst to try to convince him to remain in place, but she went along. They were going to get a better car, have a nicer house, uh, have plenty of food. It was going to be wonderful. And then when she comes back, she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. No, he hasn't. You made a bad decision, and you suffered the consequences of that. She said, I went out full. Uh, yeah. Isn't that interesting? I went out full. During a famine, she was full, and she left. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty. 
Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? You better watch out you don't start blaming God for the consequences of bad decisions you make. The prodigal son, I'm going to be preaching a sermon on the prodigal son on Sunday. The prodigal son made a comeback. No matter how deep a ditch you dig for yourself with bad fear-based decisions, you can make a comeback tonight. The prodigal son, after he took his inheritance, lived in riotous living, he said, I will arise and go to my father. It's time to return. It was time for Naomi to get real with herself. And she walked right back into destiny. We know that when she went back, she tried to talk her daughters-in-law into staying in Moab, Moab because they were Moabitish women. Moabites are enemies of Israel. She didn't want to take them with her because she knew or thought uh, that they would be prejudiced against. They would be abused. They wouldn't have any opportunity. They weren't her people. Stay with your people. That's what's best for you. Orpah remained in uh, Moab. Ruth went with Naomi, and she made that famous uh, discourse, uh, I'm going to make your God my God, and I'm going to make your people my people. And she went back with Naomi, and she stepped into the destiny that should have been Elimelech's, should have been the destiny of her sons. It's time to quit chasing what you think is a better, more comfortable life, and get back to chasing the will of God and remaining in place. It's better to stay put and remain in place and wait for better days. And we know that when Naomi went back to Israel, Ruth met Boaz without getting into the whole story. They marry, they have a child. Naomi embraces that child. She has a grandchild now. And that child became the father of Obed and that man became the father of King David. She stepped into an unbelievable destiny. God salvaged for her because she went back to the address where she belonged that she should never have left in the first place. Vera Lynn was a 22-year-old entertainer at the beginning of World War II. If you ever have a chance, listen to her sing. She's got the most incredible voice. And at the beginning of World War II, somebody wrote a song for her to sing. And it became like an anthem. It made an emotional connection with the population of England because unlike other countries in Europe, England refused to surrender to Germany. We're going to fight. Bombs are falling. The Nazis were trying to demoralize civilians by killing them and then getting them to appeal to their government to surrender. That was their strategy. But she wrote about better days that were to come if we just hold our ground and fight. And the song is called The White Cliffs of Dover. Listen to the words. I can't sing like she did, so I'm just going to read them. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow, just you wait and see. When you hear her sing it, there's a tone of defiance in what she's singing. Better days are going to come. There'll be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Just you wait and see. There'll be love and laughter and peace ever after tomorrow when the world is free. The shepherd will tend his sheep and the valley will bloom again and Jimmy will go to sleep in his own little bed again. One of the reasons why that song was such a hit during World War II was because it touched people's hearts and it gave them hope and it changed the way that they viewed things. There will be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. This war will come to an end. We can win if we resist. We're going to have to suffer. Things aren't good now, but we're not leaving. And we're not surrendering. Another song was written that she sang called We'll Meet Again. It's about two young people that met, and they married quickly because he had to go off to war. And she sang another song that moved people. 
We'll meet again. Don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Keep smiling through just like you always do till the blue sky drives these dark clouds away. You have to have hope for better days coming. We will meet again. She wrote another, she sang another song uh, called They'll Always Be in England. And guess what? The war ended. The bombs started, stopped falling. The enemies were defeated. Peace and better days came. That's what happens when you wait right where you are. Obey God. Remain in covenant relationship with the address God has for your life. And believe that the dark clouds are going to evaporate one day. The bombs are going to start falling. The famine's going to come to an end. And destiny will still be in front of us. That's what you have to believe God for. Don't live a fear-based life and sacrifice your destiny. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to have pastor come in a few moments and I really felt inspired to preach this sermon tonight. I don't know where all of you are at, but I know the temptation